Hi, I'm Jordi Izzard. I'm Associate Director of Alumni Relations at SICE, and uh, today's date is March 24th, 2014, and I'm here with uh, Bill Douglas, who graduated from SICE in 1957 with his MA, and we're just going to have a bit of a conversation. Thanks so much for being with us today. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, and why don't we just start with what maybe originally brought you to SICE? Well, originally I had an undergraduate degree from the University of Washington in international relations and my uh, goal at that point in life I thought was to become a U.S. Foreign Service officer and my faculty advisor said uh, you'd do well to go get an M.A. in international relations and that would help you uh, try and get into the Foreign Service. And since the alternative was um, to spend two years as a private in the U.S. Army at that time, I opted for graduate school. And I did not want to go to a um, academically oriented graduate program to become a college professor because I had no intention of becoming a college professor. I wanted a course uh, program for practitioners of international relations. I wanted to do it, not study and teach about it. And so I talked to my advisor and he said, well, there's Fletcher, there's Sice, and there's Georgetown. These are the three schools that are training practitioners, not mm -hmm. academicians. So I applied to Georgetown and Sice and to Fletcher and uh, was offered money by both Fletcher and Sice and SICE actually offered me a free ride, tuition, books, room, breakfast, all free. So I came to SICE. And breakfast? And breakfast. Wow. I forget whether we got lunch also. We did not get dinner. We had to eat dinner at Shoals Colonial Cafeteria, which we all walked down to, which was a Washington institution. And because they had a uh, coleslaw for a nickel and many things that people could afford. Okay. So I came to SICE because I wanted a program for practitioners and because they offered me more money than Fletcher. That's great and tell us a little bit more about what it was like to be a student here at SICE in 55 from I guess 55 to 57. Well I was a student at the old SICE up at 1906 Florida Avenue Northwest, which was in a small red brick building. And uh, the men lived in the dormitories on the third floor. And uh, the classrooms were on the second floor. And the cafeteria for breakfast and lunch were, was on the first floor. So it was all a self-contained residential unit. The uh, girl students lived in apartments close by. And uh, so I was holed up in that building most of the time because the um, assistant dean told us the first day this program is based on a 60-hour week of class time uh, readings for the classes and working on term papers and other projects. You're expected to put in 60 hours a week. So there was not a lot of spare time for socializing. And so the big social event of the day was walking down to Shoals Colonial Cafeteria for dinner. Uh, other than that, we were pretty much had our nose in our books quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the building had previously been Miss Gunston's School for Girls and was a, a finishing school for young ladies of the Washington, D.C. elite. And in the bedrooms on the third floor, uh, I remember there were little plastic cherubs flying all around the roof of my bedroom I shared with George Culberson the first year, who I believe later became an admiral in the U.S. Navy, but I'm not sure. And uh, in the bathrooms, of course, having been Miss Gunston's school for girls, there were no urinals, which was one thing I remember. <laughs> and uh, 
that building no longer exists. It was torn down and replaced. But there was an auxiliary building on 18th Street and uh, 19th Street, it must have been. And you walk through the alley behind Miss Gunston's school and into the other building, which had been uh, a building of the Pan American Union. It was built back probably in the early 1930s. So it was built in Latino style. It was this kind of Mexican style building in the middle of D.C. And that building is still there. And uh, that's where I took the course I am teaching now mm -hmm. on ethics and international affairs. I took in 1956 in that building which was originally the Pan American Union's building. And we there were three of us in the class. It was a special seminar. And uh, we met for three hours a week, not two. And my professor was a gentleman named Paul Nitze. So I'm teaching the same course I took in 1956 from Paul Nitze. And I still have my class notes I took. And it's a course on international ethics, so they uh, are just as good today as they were then. Nothing has improved in the intervening half century. So, uh, despite the alleged 60 hour a week, which I don't think all of us quite made, uh, we, we had a good time. There was a big costume party every year. And everyone had to take an area study. You could take Europe, you could take Asia, you could take Latin America, you could take Africa, you could take the Middle East. And, uh, at the costume party, everybody wore costumes from their area. Tried, if you're Middle East, you put a towel around your head, tried to be an Arab. And a uh, number of the students had actually lived in these countries. So everybody dressed up and they hired a band. And we had a big dance in the main room uh, of the other building, which had more space. <laughs> so uh, that was. A big event every year was the <coughs> regional costume party. That's great. And uh, the other one, we had the student talent show every year. Mm -hmm. Which they still have. Which, we, which mm -hmm. I have performed in, actually. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> one year, <coughs> must have been um, 56, uh, My Fair Lady was the hit musical on Broadway. So a couple of the students got together and wrote a parody of My Fair Lady called My Fair Sice. And they wrote new words to all the same melodies. And they worked, I don't think they did any studying for three weeks. They did this whole musical parodying My Fair Lady. And uh, there were other shows, but that one took up most of the time that year. That's great. What about when you graduated from SICE? What, tell us a little, uh, about your career. You've been at SICE for a long time, and what, what, yeah, tell us what happened when you graduated. Well, uh, as a student advisor in recent years, I'm always amused when the students come in to discuss their career plan with me <laughs> to see whether it makes sense. And of course, I'm thinking, kid, nobody ever does what they were trained for, so forget the career plan. For example, uh, my area study uh, at SAIS was Northeast Asia. I was interested where China and Japan and Russia came together. And so for my language I took Russian, because that was one of the three powers. So I then spent uh, 34 years working in Spanish and Latin American affairs. and. Uh, having studied Russian so, so hard, and I got through the proficiency exam basically because of the generosity of a fellow student named Oleg Yershkovsky, who was a Ukrainian but also spoke Russian. And he coached me through the Russian courses, and I would never have passed 
that exam if it wasn't for Olyag, huh. who died about two years ago, I believe. Anyway, um, so I took Russian in Northeast Asia and I ended up working most of my working life in Latin American affairs in my best Spanish. Uh, and my Latin friends once thanked me for my innovative contributions to the language of Cervantes. So uh, the point is you don't often end up actually doing what you were trained to and your career plan is like in the military they say a battle plan is what you have till the first shot is fired and then everything goes crazy. So I worked with trade unions in Latin America with a, a private organization, what we would now call a civil society organization, an NGO sponsored by the AFL-CIO, the American Labor Movement, to assist uh, trade unions in Latin America. It started out as part of Kennedy's Alliance for Progress. And our organization was created by the AFL-CIO and its policies were controlled by the AFL-CIO. The board of directors of our institute happened to be the executive council of the AFL-CIO, same people. But our money came from USAID contracts. Mm -hmm. So during the Nixon years and the Reagan years, when the government was in control of anti-union Republicans and we were uh, trying to get money from the government, it was a delicate balancing operation, but we succeeded and we, uh, we worked uh, right through both Democratic and Republican administrations. So I tell my students now I'm an odd mix of academician and trade unionists I would hope academician here and trade unionist here. That's great. And up until when did you do that? Well, I did that uh, full-time or part-time. The last 20 years I was a part-time consultant because I also got into university teaching. I had taught for three years after I got my PhD from Princeton. I taught in universities in Seoul, Korea, third year on a Fulbright teaching professorship. And then I taught one year at the University of South Carolina after I came home from Korea. And then I spent 34 years full-time or part-time with the American Institute for Free Labor Development working in with Latin American affairs. Three years of those living in Peru and directing our programs there. But in uh, 1979, I was working part-time in an international labor program over at Georgetown University. And Dean Joe Pettit of the School of Continuing Education had just started a new MA program for mid-career adults taught in the evenings for people who might have an MA in chemistry or physics or engineering and would wake up at age 40 and say, I've never studied philosophy, I've never studied literature, I've never studied religion. Yeah. I'm not educated in the European sense, I'm a technician. So they come into the liberal studies program to broaden out and uh, Joe said, we need somebody to teach a course on international relations. Could you do that? And I said, yeah, I just did it in Korea. So in 1979, I started teaching in that Georgetown uh, MA program for adults. And I'm still teaching in it once a year. I've been doing it for 34 years now. That's great. So uh, <clears throat> I worked in the Labor Institute part-time and I did some teaching and some other consulting, and that went right up through uh, 1997. Great. And then uh, I worked for a year and a half with a um, consulting firm doing development work for USAID World Learning, and uh, then I got a call from SICE and they, I had been teaching a course on labor and international labor and development 
with a friend of mine, an economist, in the Social Change and Development Program for mm -hmm. SICE. With Grace. With Grace, Grace mm -hmm. Goodell and Margaret. And uh, then uh, SICE called me up and said, we're going to expand that program and add on to it a general program on international development. SCND was a very specific program on certain aspects, social aspects of development. But a lot of students wanted to come to SICE who wanted to do other aspects of development. And there was a big demand for that. And so they said, we're going to, on top of SC&D, add a general international development program. But we're not sure it's going to work. So we want to run it for one year on a trial basis to see if it flies. And uh, so we want an interim director. And I said, fine, I'll be the interim director. And I was then 67 years old or something, so I said, uh, if it doesn't work out, you've got no disposal program. I'll just kiss my horse and ride off into the sunset. Well, uh, the program we estimated would probably work up to about 50 students, counting SC&D and the new general IDEV program after a year or two. And the first year, we had 90. I don't know how they, it wasn't even printed in the catalog. It wasn't decided to go ahead with it till after. I don't know how all these students knew about it. But we were inundated with IDEV students. And uh, they decided to continue the program, but they couldn't find a permanent director. So I spent a second year as the interim director in a third year. And by the fourth year, these students were calling me the eternal interim director. So I uh, ran the, the new general IDEB program and the SC&D program with Margaret Frondorf for uh, four years. And that was from 2001 to 2005. So uh, I worked with the Labor Institute from 1964, full or part-time, through 1997. And uh, then, finally, uh, the search committee came up with a very, very good idea. They had been looking outside size to all kinds of famous people that had well-established careers in international development. But they were all well established and living in Boston or Chicago or San Francisco didn't want to pull up their families and move. And finally, they looked around sites and here was Frank Fukuyama, who did not have any program to run. He was just had his own uh, endowed chair. So they asked Frank, would you like to take on the directorship of the IDEV program. And I was talking to him about it, and he said, well, I, I'm not sure I want to do this, but he said, you know, I'm in my 40s now, and it's, uh, it's time I, I got to decide what I want to do when I grow up. And he said, I've never held an administrative position. I have no idea whether I'm any good at administration, so I think I better find out. So he decided to take it. So. I was succeeded, and we finally had a permanent director. And that was in 05? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. 2001 to 2005, okay. Frank was the director. And uh, there is nothing Frank Fukuyama does poorly. He was a great administrator. And I was some kind of deputy or something for transitional purposes, so I worked part-time with the program under Frank for another couple of years. Uh -huh. Four years, actually. Till 2009. And then, uh, in 2009 to 2011, I was a visiting professor at the Hopkins Nanjing Center in uh -huh. China. And that was a great experience. And in the second year, I get a call from uh, uh, John um, Harrington long distance 
from the United States. Hello, Bill. What do you want, John? Well, Bill, I just called to say hello. What do you want, John? And he said, well, um, Frank is leaving to go to Stanford, and uh, we need a year to find a new permanent director. John, I said, I did it four years. That was it. I'm planning to retire when I get off the plane next year from Nanjing. Well, we really need you, Bill. Well, when you're, by that time I was 78 years old, and when one of the leading schools of international affairs pleads with you at age 78 to come back and work for them, it's kind of hard to say no. So I became the yet again the interim director of the IDEV program. This would be the fifth year, four years the first time. No, I became, that was the year I, that Cinnamon Dornsife and I were interim co-directors of the program. And uh, I've still been doing a little bit of consulting work for them ever since. and. Uh, I still teach my course on international ethics here that I took from Paul Nitze, which is under the Global Theory and History program here. So my course career was very different from what I expected. I passed the Foreign Service written exam after graduating from SAIS and uh, was scheduled for orals and then they called me up and they said, we already know you're going to fail the physical, so we won't give you the orals. And I said, well, why don't you let me take the orals anyway? If I fail, there's not many people pass, then you don't have to worry about me. But if I pass, I'll at least have the satisfaction of knowing I pass both the written and the orals. They said, Mr. Douglas, it costs the United States government $300 to administer an oral exam, and we know you can't pass the physical, so we won't do it. So I never got to take it the orals, and having failed the physical, I thought I'm not going to be a Foreign Service officer. So I applied to USIA and the Information Agency, failed the physical. And then I applied to um, a couple of other jobs, failed the U.S. Army officers physical, failed the U.S. Air Force officers physical. So I thought, I'd better have another arrow in my quiver professionally. And so I decided to go get a PhD so that if I couldn't be a practitioner of international affairs, I would become an academician, at least be employed. And uh, so I got a PhD in politics at Princeton. And at Princeton, it's not in political science, it's in politics. Uh -huh. They don't kid themselves that this is some kind of science. Right. So uh, that's why I went on for a PhD, which is not what I planned to do when I entered SAIS. Uh -huh. And uh, it has turned out to be useful. That's great. Now, in thinking about your career, wow, you've done a lot. Um, and you're still here. It's not over. Um, what would you... What advice might you have for a current student today? Well, I guess one piece of advice is that uh, prepare yourself to be flexible. They, they say these days everybody will change, change professions twice during their working lifetime. I think that's a pretty good estimate. And so uh, suppose your hope is to work in Latin American affairs, so you take Latin American studies here but you want to make sure you pay attention to your other courses and get a lot of the economics and don't forget it so that you, you've got a lot of tools in your toolkit to offer employers because what you end up working in is totally unpredictable. So you've got to be adaptable and flexible. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being with us today and for sharing your story. My pleasure.